a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler66, Hour of the Truth. Uh, without any more delay, I will start reading the second part of Martin Luther's views on the Antichrist that um, I started yesterday. So today I will continue where I yesterday uh, took off, uh, if I find that here in the document. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's no problem. I think it was on page 5 uh, where it led us to. And um, then we're going to pick it up right there on the top of page 6 it is. An address to the Christian nobility. That is the second part in this, uh, in this paper. Now, um, if you want to know what I have to say about that uh, Luther, uh, Luther address to the Christian nobility, which full name is Address to the Christian Nobility of the German Nation, Concerning the reform of the Christian estate that he wrote in 1520, this uh, article continues here with that. But if you want to know more about that, I read that in Hour of the Truth in English. Um, so when you go to the archives on uh, Hour of the Truth, you will see two or three broadcasts where I read and analyzed and discussed uh, Luther's writing of 1520, addressed to the Christian nation. Um, that we are going here to, because you know this paper here I am reading to give you an overview, if you can call it like that, what was Luther's view on the Antichrist, what was Luther's journey to actually um, learn that the papacy was the Antichrist. And as soon as he learned it, what did he do? I mean, what was his action on that? You know, that's an interesting question you can ask yourself. When you find out, biblically, historically and prophetically, that the papacy always was, is now and will be until the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Antichrist of the Bible, the question is, what are you going to do with that knowledge? Are you going to stand up and protest? Are you going to uh, shout it from the rooftops? Are you going to make videos about that, like I do, like Tom Fress does? And there are not so many people more I can count on. Maybe even that SDR guy, Nicholas, from God, Presence of God Ministry. Okay, he makes a lot of videos, and he knows that the papacy is the Antichrist, and he says that in his videos. But Tom Fress, his whole Ministry of Inquisition update is dedicated to that and to the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, which is the lie of the wrong interpretation of Daniel's 70th week, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And I also have a lot in my ministry that deals with that. And I will claim and th sh throw, I wanted to say, and shouted from the rooftops until the day I die that the papacy is the biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist. Nobody is going to shut me down for that. I tell you that. How about you? Do you have the same understanding? And because, well, let me, let me just put it this way. If you have the same understanding, and I'm not attacking you or anything, don't get me wrong. But when you have the same understanding and you are quiet about it, what do you think the Lord will do when you stand before him in judgment? And when you get asked why you didn't warn your brethren, why didn't you warn the world about the deception we're all living in? Think about what your answer will be. I know that when he asks me, that I can say, 
I did everything that I think I had in my power to warn others about this. The Lord says, go into the world and preach the gospel to all creatures. But to preach the gospel also entails, or is that the right word, entails? Uh, let me just look that up. <laughs> yeah, it's the right word. That also entails telling who the enemy is. Uh, who is the enemy of mankind? Who is the enemy of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? Who is the enemy of all your brothers and sisters out there who have no idea who the Antichrist is? The Antichrist and Satan. I'm sorry, I'm already ranting about five minutes in an introduction into the reading and that wasn't my idea. I just wanted to go really very fast to the reading. But I think that this, what I'm just saying, is something that we really have to think about. We all are responsible for our deeds and our good works as Christians are not done because we want to get saved, but they are an expression why we are saved. This is, those are the fruits that we are bearing because Jesus saved us. And these fruits we must put out to the world. And when you are really a lover of the truth and a lover of the word of God, don't you feel the urge inside your body? Don't you feel it nagging on you that you have to get this message out and support people who are putting this message out? And with support, I don't speak about financial support. I speak about supporting in the way, for example, that when you have a YouTube channel that is quite empty, because I know a lot of my subscribers have empty channels, what hinders you to download videos like this and re-upload them on your channel? My work and also, yeah, Tom Fress, I cannot say, Tom Fress's work is, of course, completely <laughs> free, actually, as mine is, but there is somebody else who claims the rights for Tom Fress's work, so that's something else. But um, videos like the videos that I produce are completely copyright free. And they can be re-uploaded on YouTube, on Dailymotion, on Vimeo, on I don't know what other video platform. They can be shared in Facebook and Twitter and, I don't know, all these social networks. Everywhere. To wake the people up. My dear brothers and sisters, we are living in the end times. It gets worse and worse every day. Now is the time to speak. Luther had a saying, The time of silence is gone, the time to speak has begun. Something like that, he said. And he is right. And he also said, peace if possible, but the truth at all costs. Don't compromise the truth. Don't compromise God's word. Make sure to spread God's word. And God's word is not only about how to get saved, but God's word also is to tell the people who the enemy is, that they don't see living in this matrix. They have no idea. Most of the people have no idea how deep this really goes. Because they are all involved in politics. They go even vote or discuss different political agendas, different, different political parties, or candidates, which is absolutely a waste of time, an absolutely waste of time and waste of your breath. You won't change the political structure in this world, the landscape of this world, politically. Nobody will change that, because that's all in the hands of the Antichrist. The, politic is from the politics is from the devil. That's why he rules politics, because it's his. It's this little horsey, you know. And he puts these horses into the race and you think, well, whether the right wins or the left wins. Last time I've, I've chosen for the right one, now I choose the left one. You always choose a horse of the devil. Instead of choosing the horse, the white horse, 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, if I may say so. Don't get drawn into the worldly affairs. And what do I mean with worldly affairs? Everything that is not spiritual. And that, my dear brothers and sisters, is a lot. Think about it. What that all entails. But now let's go to the reading on the top of page 6 here, addressed to the Christian nobility. Now Luther's pen began to fly. First came addressed to the Christian nation, uh, Christian nobility of the German nation concerning the reform of the Christian estate, which went to press on June 30th, uh, 13th, uh, the, uh, June 13, 1520, or the 13th of June. Let's we say, let's say it this way. Early in this treatise, a book that repeatedly linked the papacy and Antichrist, came Luther's reaction to Prierius' appalling statement. Quote, it must have been the very prince of devils who said what was written in canon law. If the Pope were so scandalously bad as to lead souls in crowds to the devil, yet he could not be deposed. On this accursed and devilish foundation they built at Rome, and think that we should let, it, let all the world go to the devil rather than resist their nevery. It is to be feared that this is a game of Antichrist, or a sign that he is close at hand." Unquote. Luther, then, Luther then suggested calling a free church council. <laughs> yeah, Luther was already speaking in 1520 about a free church council. And the book that I'm going to read of which this year is a pre, this precursor, <laughs> and um, uh, how do you say a um, an introductory to against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. That book, the first part that he speaks about, which in the German 86 pages takes 50 pages, he rants about a free council. And almost nothing else. And that whole book where that is in found, the first part deals only about a free council. And also in his work of um, the address to the Christian nation, the Christian nobility, he is calling for a free council, as the author says here, absolutely correctly. Luther then suggested calling a free church council and said, if the Pope tried to block this free church council, he would be hindering the church's edification, thus violating 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8, which Luther paraphrased as, quote, God has given us authority not for the destruction, but for the edification of Christendom, unquote. Then Luther said, it is only the power of the devil and of Antichrist which resists the things that serve for the edification of Christendom. Unquote. If the Pope claimed the power to interpret the scriptures by mere authority, that would, like trying to prevent or control a church council, be evidence that the papacy was, in truth, the communion of Antichrist and of the devil. Luther said. And that's the point. And that's the point in Luther's book against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil and in this whole Luther works uh, volume uh, 41 that I told you about. It's all about these councils. And it took until 1545 until that council was convened. And then it was not a free council. That was the Council of Trent. That was not free. That was the very first council completely started and run by the Jesuit order in their starting years, because they were ordained as a uh, papal order in 1540 by Pope Paul III, as you know. 
Just five years later, they started the Council of Trent. They ran the Council of Trent. That was not a free council. And you're going to learn about that when I read to you from Martin Luther's book Against the Papacy and Institution of the Devil. Watch out for that. Because here it is just, just a mentioning in one or two sentences. There it is about pages and pages and pages where he goes on about this free council. Quoting Christ's warning in Matthew 24, the author continues about false prophets and performing signs and wonders so as to deceive the elect, Luther said miracles were no proof of papal authority. He said 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9 had predicted that Antichrist shall, through power of Satan, be mighty and lying wonders. And just think of the different Mary apparitions you have all over the world. Think of the uh, apparition of Fatima in uh, 1917, if I'm not mistaken, in Portugal over there. These are mighty and lying wonders through the power of Satan that the Antichrist performs in this world. Luther also attacked as Quote, the very works of the very Antichrist, unquote, papal claims to power over earthly authorities and even over angels. Reminding his readers that Jesus said his kingdom was not of this world, Luther bluntly said no vicar's rule can go beyond his lord's. These over-presumptuous claims were devil-devised devices to facilitate bringing in Antichrist and raising the Pope above God, as many are already doing, Luther said. Commenting on the report that the Pope had prevented the Bishop of Strasbourg from implementing moral reforms in his diocese, Luther said, quote, Thus priests are to be encouraged against their own bishop, and their disobedience to divine law is to be protected. Antichrist himself, I hope, will not dare to put God to such open shame. Unquote. Luther then spoke of the corruption of immorality in, uh, of the corruption and immorality in Rome. Quote, there is buying, selling, bartering, trading, trafficking, lying, deceiving, robbing, stealing, luxury, harlotry navery and every sort of contempt of God and even the rule of Antichrist could not be more scandalous." Unquote. He also complained of papal legates accepting money to legalize unjust gain and dissolve oath, vows and agreements, while saying the Pope has authority to do this. This alone, Luther said, was enough to prove the Pope the true Antichrist. By their fruits you will know them. He complained of papal legates accepting money to legalize unjust gain. What is that what we have today when you ask for a license because you are asking to do something that is otherwise not legal? That's what a license is for. This alone, Luther said, was enough to prove the Pope the true Antichrist. By accepting money for annulling oaths, the Pope was suppressing God's, command, uh, God's commandment and exalting his own commandment over it, according to Luther, who added, if he is not Antichrist, then let someone else tell me who he can be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if Luther was poised, uh, was, po uh, was posing, um, was um, yeah posing that question nowadays, 2017 or a few years earlier or probably a few years from here, people come up with all kinds of ideas who the Antichrist is because of the ecumenical movement and because of the futurist lie of the Antichrist that has been told in the in the churches since um, the early 1800s, the early 19th century. But futurism was a complete unknown doctrine in the time of Luther. Preterism was a complete unknown doctrine in the time of Luther. We have to understand that those were Jesuit-invented 
ways to interpret the Holy Scripture. But the Jesuits did not exist at this time when Luther was writing this. So there was only the historicist view. There was only the biblical view. There was no other view. Today we are only getting in... Uh, how do you say that? Um, we are getting confused because of futurism and preterism and historicism because we have three different ways to accept I, I, I'd like to say, but accept is not the right word, to read and analyze scripture, but only of the three, one way is correct. The only one way is the biblical way, the historicist way, the way that it is written, the way that it is meant from the beginning. The other two are later inventions. So please don't come to me with all these claims of, but the Antichrist can be this and the Antichrist can be that, because you cannot prove that with scripture. Whereas I can prove without a doubt, without beyond any doubt, by scripture, by the King James Bible, that the papacy is the biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist. And there is no other. So everybody, every other dogma on the antichrist must be a lie. And the lie cannot be proven with the truth, which is the Bible. So when you say anybody else is the Antichrist, then the papacy, you cannot biblically prove that. Oh yeah, you can take here and there a verse and say, oh, but if you read it like this, then this one is the Antichrist. And if you read it like that, that one is the Antichrist. But you cannot, you can never, ever refute Daniel chapter 7. You can never ever refute Second Thessalonians 2, especially verse 7. You can never ever refute Revelation 13 and 17. Impossible. Absolutely impossible because the Bible is the only book that explains itself. If it is the correct Bible, if it is the King James Bible. And by that, there is no proof for another antichrist oh yeah there is lots and lots of speculation There's lots and lots of people who think this might be the antichrist that might be the antichrist people who just are not sure in scripture run after every little ball you throw like a dog here go fetch here go fetch here go fetch but they never catch the truth because the truth is only in the Bible and Luther said if he is not Antichrist then let someone else tell me who he can be but prove it with the word of God prove it with scripture like he said later on when he was standing there in Worms 1521 I can only recant he said if you can prove me wrong by scripture he didn't use these words, but that's the gist, that's the idea. And that's why they never could refute him. Scripture does not tell a lie. Scripture does not support any lie. And that is why biblically and with the history mirrored in the Bible, we can prove with beyond any doubt that the papacy is the Antichrist. And Luther knew that. Luther knew that he could stand on the Bible as his rock. He knew that only the Bible could refute him. So he says, okay, refute me, biblically, show me. And nobody ever could. Nevertheless, after saying all this, Luther held out an olive branch to Pope Leo X. He implied that his quarrel was not with the Pope himself, but with the Roman Curia, which was, he said, undeniably, quote, more corrupt than any Babylon or Sodom ever was, so that Antichrist himself should 
he come could not add, could not add anything to its wickedness unquote. so luther was actually very polite even though he spoke very clear words he said that he has no quarrel with the pope himself but with the roman curia do you know why this is so important we are to love the man we are to hate his doctrine and his belief and his hierarchy and his system but the man we should love and that's why we should cry out from everywhere we can that the papacy is the antichrist that everybody gets a warning that even maybe the antichrist can't go and repent who am i to judge that he cannot repent i don't know his heart maybe a pope can repent there are many 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 examples of people who have gone the wrong way who have sworn oaths even to kill other people probably even killed other people during their quote-unquote office and they repented just think of alberto rivera who was a jesuit priest of the fourth vow and you don't get a jesuit of the fourth vow if you didn't kill but he repented he came to christ and if he didn't come to christ he only betrayed himself I don't judge Alberto Rivera, I don't judge anybody. I'm just telling you guys, don't you judge people like that, but show them their error. That's all we can do. But therefore, that is the greatest love that we can do, to show them the truth. That is love. Hate doesn't bring you anywhere. Doesn't bring you anywhere, doesn't bring me anywhere. I don't hate the Pope per se, but I hate the doctrine, I hate the power that stands behind it, I hate Satan. Satan is irreformable. The curia maybe is not irreformable. Who am I to judge on that? Think about it. Can you look into the heart of man? I don't think that we can even look into our own hearts completely only god can do that so with this luther held out an olive branch to pope antichrist pope leo x he implied that his quarrel was not with the pope himself leo i have nothing against you as a man but i have something against the system against the roman curia which he said was undeniable more corrupt than any babylon or sodom ever was so that antichrist should he come could not add anything to its wickedness so when this saying of martin luther comes here he says so that antichrist should he come here he already again gives the understanding that he at this moment is not a hundred percent sure of the papacy being the antichrist he is still on his journey to get absolute confirmation that's why also a little bit before he said if he is not antichrist then let someone else tell me who he can be he said okay then prove me wrong by scripture if it's not him but he still is not a hundred percent convinced but we will read further and learn of his conviction to come now we are dealing with the babylonian captivity that is um the Babylonian captivity of the church, a monumental, or a monumental, yeah, quite a big work that Luther wrote also in 1520. And when you're going to get a very, very, very deep explanation and a wonderful reading of the Babylonian captivity of Martin Luther, turn to First Amendment Radio in 2017 in the playlist Luther in his own words. And there you will find Tom Fress from Inquisition Update I think in more than 40, uh, 40 different parts, read the Babylonian captivity of the church from Martin Luther. Read and explain it to you. 
very very well done work that uh, my brother in Christ did there and you should go to uh, First Amendment Radio's YouTube channel because there you have free accessible archives to the playlist and uh, watch that reading otherwise you have to go to First Amendment Radio yourself donate a little uh, a few bucks and then you get the um, access to the archive over there but the YouTube archive is free for everybody and there Tom Fress read months yeah it, uh, it was at least two months if I'm not mistaken about the Babylon captivity of the church from Martin Luther in the writing of 1520 now in August Luther learned that Leo was sending a bull threatening him with excommunication with this Richard Marius observes all ambiguity about the Antichrist evaporated from his mind. To him, the Pope was the beast, the man of evil foretold in the New Testament, and no compromise was possible. After this, Luther published on the Babylonian captivity of the Church, which charged the papacy with leading believers into a new captivity criticizing those who claimed that the Pope had, quote, the power to make laws, unquote, Luther wrote, unless they will abandon their laws and restore to Christ churches their liberty, they are guilty of all the souls that perish under this captivity, and the papacy is of a truth, the kingdom of Babylon, yea, of the very Antichrist. End of quote. Luther wrote, Unless they will abandon their laws and restore to Christ's churches their liberty, they are guilty of all the souls that perish under this captivity, and the papacy is of a truth, the kingdom of Babylon, yea, of the very Antichrist. In addition, this booklet, it's about 80 pages or something, mention two specific reasons for calling the papacy antichrist first this babylon of ours had distorted the sacraments by withholding the communion cup from the laity and with the wickedness of antichrist calling it heresy for anyone to say it was necessary for laymen to have access to the cup as well as to the bread now i'm not going very deep into this because otherwise I become a second Tom Fress and I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but he went in extensionally into this, um, uh, what we actually call the Holy Communion, breaking the bread and drinking the wine and breaking the bread in remembrance of Jesus Christ as his body and drinking the wine in remembrance as of that as his blood with which he signed the new covenant. That is the, called the Holy Communion, as we uh, do that biblically, in remembrance of Jesus Christ. And of course, Tom Fress went um, in length into uh, not only discussing the false Roman Catholic dogma of transubstantiation, which is connected with this, but also about um, the Roman Catholic Church splitting this up. Uh, that was centuries already before... Uh, Martin Luther came on the scene that the Roman Catholic Church forbade the normal people to drink from the cup when they went to Holy Communion. They only got the bread. And why is that? I think that is something I read in whether it was in Babylon Mystery Religion or it was in Alexander Hislop's uh, The Two Babylons. I don't know. Doesn't matter. Um, the point why the Roman Catholic Church uh, did that, and still today in certain places in the world, I guess, does it, is because they say, well, if something from the blood gets spilled, uh, when you don't drink that rightfully, but something gets spilled on your clothes, or something of the cup runs next to your mouth, or even something sticks in your beard, or whatever, um, that that is an abomination. <laughs> calling that an abomination yeah no that's how the roman catholic church is using um <clears throat> it's a um it's a how do they say that uh it's a sacrilege <laughs> to do that so to avoid 
points like these, the laymen were forbidden to share the cup. They were only giving the bread. It was only half of the communion. Yeah? And um, it was calling heresy for anyone to say it was necessary for laymen to have access to the cup as well as to the bread. So the Roman Catholic Church actually turns that around and says, when you say that you want to have the whole communion, the bread and the wine, that's even heresy. Now, second was the annulment of legitimate marriages, of which Luther said, quote, I am incensed at that barefaced wickedness, which is so ready to put asunder what God hath joined together, that one may well send Antichrist in it, for it opposes all that Christ has done and taught. What earthly reason is there in holding that or relative of a, de uh, of a deceased husband even to the fourth degree may marry the latter's widow now we go into the 1520 publications of martin luther martin luther wrote three tracts in that year three very important tracts two we spoke about already babylonian captivity of the church and um, uh, the one to the German nobility and uh, in the treatise on the Christian liberty he denounced the soul-destroying traditions of our popes as snares by which numberless souls had been dragged down to hell clearly the work of Antichrist in the treatise on usury he again discussed Rome's Antichrist-like financial exploitation of German fools while in his treatise on the New Testament he said in the context of the papal denial of the cup to the laity, quote, The Pope does not have a hair's breadth of power to change what Christ has made, and whatever of these things he changes, he does as a tyrant and antichrist. Now, in the next part in this text, I'm not going to read that today because... Um, that will be too long because we are going into Luther's response to the bull, the bull that he received from Antichrist Pope Leo X of his excommunication, which is called Exorgi Domine. And I'm going to read that completely to you when we read this next time, because this is what I do. <laughs> this is what I think is real research about, that we can also read the complete bull of excommunication of Martin Luther. So I just want to uh, share a few words on the last sentence here, because it says in the treatise on, on usury, he again discussed Rome's antichrist-like financial exploitation of German fools, where we have to remember that um, before we read already, squeeze the gold from the German fools in any way you can. And when we go into the book against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil, you will even understand this more. So I'm not even discussing this right now because I don't want to spoil the things to come. Um, this expression of the Germans and the German fools is something that Luther uh, expands on in the book about the Antichrist. And in the next part that we are going to read in this paper, we are first and for all going into Exergi Domine, Luther's response to the papal bull that Leo X signed on January 3rd, 1521. And um, we're going to read, of course, a little bit in this article here about what happened at that time, about the bull. And then I'm, uh, I'm going to read the complete bull and probably a little bit more to that. But therefore, to start this right now, we are uh, 38 minutes in the video. That would be too long, and I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to stop it here, and I'm going to put that off for the next reading. So we stop a little bit early, a little bit shy of an hour today. Nevertheless, I enjoyed this reading very much, and it's of course the explanation, and I hope that you get what I wanted to tell you with this. I hope that you got the message. And again, I encourage you to proclaim the Antichrist, to proclaim that the papacy is the biblical, historical and prophetic every Christ everywhere. Everywhere. Re-upload videos like this, please. If you love Christ, if you love the truth, 
that is something we all should do. And with this, I'm going to end for today. Jogler 66 wishes you a nice day, God's blessing, and until next time, signing off. Bye-bye.